Hello students. So we finished talking about taxes on demand last time. Now we'll move on to talk about taxes on producers. So a lot of this will be very similar to what we saw earlier. Taxes place a wedge between the amount the consumer pays and the amount the producer receives. So let's go back to our example of the $5 widget and a $1 tax. This time, however, the tax will be paid by the firm. So consumer pays $5, the price of the widget. The firm gets that $5, but then they pay a $1 tax to the government. Overall, then, the firm only receives $4 out of the 5 that the consumer paid. So the gap between what the consumer pays and what the firm receives. So what that does on the graph is that it's going to shift the supply curve back. Demand is going to be the same demand curve as before. Demand does not shift. We said earlier that changes in price give you a movement along the demand curve. And here the um, tax will affect price, but that gives you only a movement along demand. Demand does not shift. Supply will shift, however. So it's going to shift up, or shift back, I should say, by the amount of the tax. So let's say producers are producing quantity Q over here. So originally before the tax, they wanted to accept a price as low as that amount. Once you put a tax in place though, they have to receive this much money so that after they pay a tax, they're still getting that minimum that they would have accepted. So you gotta shift the supply up by the amount of the tax in order to account for that effect. So you get a new supply curve that's going to be raised by the amount of the tax. So here's how consumer and producer surplus are affected. So we saw last time that a tax on consumers can still squeeze producer surplus. Similarly, a tax that's supposed to be paid by firms is going to reduce consumer surplus. Consumers are harmed because prices go up. So when supply shifts back because of the tax, that raises price. So prices used to be over here, P star, where old supply meets demand. Once supply shifts back due to the tax, that raises prices to be up here at price P. That's when a new supply curve meets demand. Consumers don't like paying higher prices, so that's going to cut into their consumer surplus. Remember, CS is what the consumers are willing to pay, as their demand, minus what they actually pay. If what they actually pay is getting bigger, then that's going to cut into their overall surplus. They're also hurt by the reduction in quantity. So you just get this quantity Q star out here, that'd be at this point on this other graph. That's where old supply meets demand. However, once you put the tax in place, fewer units are being bought and sold. So that's also cutting into consumer surplus. So taxes on firms hurt consumers. So you might hear some politicians say, I'm not I'm gonna fight for the people. I wanna have consumers be as well off as possible. We're gonna have we're gonna really make those firms pay their fair share. What actually happens though is that at least part of that burden on firms gets passed on to consumers in the form of higher prices. Now producers are also harmed by a tax on producers, which is not really a surprise. So producer surplus 
used to be this big triangle down here, it shrinks due to the tax. So the tax is going to lower the price that producers effectively get. Now prices do go up. They used to be over here, but now they're up at P instead. However, the price net of taxes, P minus T, is lower than what the producers used to get. So that's going to reduce producer surplus. Net of taxes, they're getting less money per unit than they got before. They're also selling fewer units or selling Q instead of selling Q star. Like we saw earlier, if you reduce both the height of a triangle and its base, that triangle gets smaller. So producer surplus goes down. So while both producers and consumers are harmed, there's a benefit to the government in the form of revenue. So this up here is P and we have P minus T. The gap between them must be a tax T. So this distance, this height of this purple rectangle is tax per unit. Tax per unit times number of units, that is base times height, is area, which is total revenue. So total revenue is going to be that purple rectangle. That partially compensates for the loss to consumers and producers. However, some of the loss to welfare is just completely gone and does not benefit the government or anybody else. That's this red debt weight loss triangle. Same story as before, these trades over here would have benefited both consumers and producers. Consumers are willing to pay this amount given by their demand curve. Producers would have accepted this amount given by their supply curve. So these trades would have benefited both of them. Consumers were more than willing to pay a price that producers would have accepted. However, because of the tax, those transactions which benefit both sides no longer take place. Like I said before, you're not going to pay a $3 tax to get $1 surplus. That's just not worth it. That's worth negative two overall. And you don't want negative two. So those lost transactions harm society and those lost transactions do not benefit the government. The government only taxes transactions that take place. They don't, tend, they don't tax transactions that don't happen. So again, we're not trying to say you should never tax. Rather, if you are going to tax and you do have to, you better use that money very, very wisely because it costs society more than $1 to raise $1 of revenue. You can also look at how the tax burden is effectively distributed. So here, once again, it looks like the producers pay more effectively than consumers do, just like we saw in the previous episode. That's not always true. Again, we'll clarify in um, the fourth section what determines who bears the burden. So let's continue with the example for now. Prices were originally P star. That's the price when you had no taxes, and that's the price that maximized overall total surplus, society's welfare. Now, consumers are harmed because they're paying a price P instead of P star. They're paying a price higher than the market price. So they pay this gap between P and P star. This is what they pay per unit. You multiply that by Q, the number of units they've bought, and that gives you the total amount that consumers are effectively paying. It's this purple rectangle. For producers, it's a bit more complicated. On one hand, producers benefit from higher prices. They like it when prices go from P star to P. They like getting more money per unit. Unfortunately, though, they don't get P. They get P minus T. They get the price minus taxes. 
taxes wipe out the gains from higher prices and then some, the price after taxes is actually going to be lower than P star. So producers are harmed by that lower effective price that they're getting. They're harmed by this much, the high of that blue rectangle. So they pay that much per unit. You can imagine if they're getting $5 per unit before, and now they're effectively getting, let's say, $3, they have effectively lost $2 per unit. They're effectively paying $2 per unit in taxes. You can then multiply it by Q units to find their total tax burden, and what you get is this blue rectangle. And there's still a deadweight loss of the loss surplus to society from transactions that no longer occur. So to develop intuition, I stress that a tax places a wedge between what the consumer pays and what the producer receives. Importantly though, the size of that gap is going to be independent of whether you tax consumers or whether you tax producers. If I tax producers by $2 per unit, then supply shifts up by $2, you get this $2 gap. If I tax consumers by $2 per unit, then demand shifts down by $2, I get the same $2 gap. And that brings us to a big and surprising lesson here. A $2 tax on supply and a $2 tax on demand do the exact same thing. Get the exact same deadweight loss, exact same total revenue for the government, exact same total amount that consumers effectively pay. You also get exact same amount that producers effectively pay. So you can imagine, let's say, um, let's say I want to go populist here and say that textbooks are way overpriced and textbook publishers need to pay their fair share. We should stop taxing textbook consumers, you guys, and put the tax on producers instead. Perhaps right now there's a $10 tax on textbooks that you pay and the price of a textbook is $100 and populist politician wants to tax the, cons the producers instead, make them pay a $10 tax, it's actually not going to do anything. What's going to happen is that the price will go up by $10 and you're still paying 110 effectively overall. The amount that pre the producers effectively pay is going to be unchanged and debt weight loss also unchanged. Now, we can look at this graphically. So here's a tax on the producers. So supply shifts back by the amount of the tax. We had this purple rectangle for what the consumers pay. Consumers got harmed by higher prices. Prices going from P star to P and that was their amount they effectively paid. Producers received a net P minus T instead of getting P star. So they lost this amount of money overall. They paid that for Q units, so they had this blue rectangle for their tax burden. If you tax demand though, you look at those two graphs, those two blue rectangles look awfully similar you could verify this mathematically, and what you'd find is that they have the exact same area. So you tax demand, and demand shifts down, or I should say demand shifts back, and um, that causes prices to fall for the producer, and they're harmed in the exact same way that they were earlier. Consumers pay the price plus a tax, and that turns out to be exactly the same as they would have paid back here, so the purple rectangle that consumers pay is going to be the same in both scenarios. 
Dead Weight Loss' this red triangle is also going to be identical. So I talked about the textbook example. Oh, let's say the price is $200. Or taxing consumers by $10 per book. So it looks like this over here. So it's so a tax on demand. So demand shifts back by that $10 amount. If we switch it around and make the publishers, the producers pay a $10 tax, we go back to our original demand curve but now supply is one shifting back. And our diagram here for who pays what looks exactly the same. Same that we lost, same amount producers pay, same amount that consumers pay. So I can verify it. Here's an intuition, a story gives you some intuition. Let's think about a tax on demand. So when you go to the bookstore, you hand $200 to the seller. They reach into your wallet again and pull an extra $10 bill. They put that into a box. That box is marked taxes. So you pay a total of $210, the 200 to the publisher, plus the $10 in taxes. The producer got only $200 out of that. They got the amount you paid them but they don't get the amount that you put in the tax collection box. If we switch it around and tax the producers, they're going to raise prices. Remember, if you tax suppliers, supply shifts back and that pushes prices up. Price will now be $10. What they do is that now you're paying the producer directly $210. Once you do that, though, they take $10 out of that and they put it into the box marked taxes. So either way, consumer still spends $210. Either way, producer still gets $200. So it doesn't matter if you tax consumers or producers, effects are identical. Now, one important caveat to add here. This is true for the, um, the unit tax we've been talking about, or the specific taxes, they're also called. This actually is not true for ad valorem taxes. I mentioned earlier that ad valorem taxes are percentage taxes. So things like a sales tax, you pay a 10% sales tax. That's an ad valorem tax. In that case, with ad valorem taxes, the effects actually are different depending upon whether you tax supply or demand. Why is that true? Well, an ad valorem tax, like a sales tax, is a percentage of price. If you tax supply, prices go up. So it's a percentage of a bigger number. If you tax demand, prices go down. So now your sales tax is a tax on a smaller number. So now it does matter if you do an ad valorem tax. Now, like I said earlier, ad valorem taxes are more complicated. That's why I reserve most of the details of that for my other class, Econ 445. So if you're curious, go ahead and take that class. I think it's a very interesting class to take. A lot of interesting subjects and look at policy and social welfare. But we do go into more depth there. So your big lesson with a unit tax, it doesn't matter if you tax supply or demand, you get the same results either way. With an ad valorem tax, a percentage tax, now things are different. So that wraps up our section on taxes on supply. In our next episode, we'll look at taxes and elasticity will determine who pays the majority, who bears most of the burden of the tax.